Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you didn't get your insurance card because you weren't here yesterday, make sure you see me before you go home today. So yesterday they mentioned that there is no um, ride coming back from LAX when we return on the 27th. I have the flight tickets here. So we are gonna board at 11.45 going home, back home to California uh, from Costa Rica on the 27th. And it's we're gonna arrive about 4 p.m. Be expected that you're gonna go through customs. So that usually take a little bit. Um, so if you have your families come to LAX to pick you up, just let them know that, you know, if they arrive at 4 p.m. to pick you up, you might not be able to exit the airport until a little bit after. So, you know, I normally give custom an hour to two hours and that's normal because sometimes they, for international flight, they always take a long time. It depends on how many flights arrived at that time and how many people on the flights before us. Um, and then if there's any issues with people bringing stuff back. So, you know, just to let them know. Now, an option for you, I was talking to my husband yesterday and I was like, Friday, LAX, you coming to pick me up. That, and then in, in the evening, late afternoon, it's going to be pretty crazy. And he's like, well, why don't you do Metrolink? And I, you know, I've done that before. Um, so Metrolink offers a bus from LAX to the train station. And if you live near downtown Riverside, it's perfect because it's so close to the train station. And there's train station across Inland Empire. So you, you will have to pay $10 for the bus and you can buy it online or you can buy it at the kiosk there. Um, I would suggest online because it's easier. So Metrolink bus is through their website. Then you can also buy a bus of train pass so when you arrive to the train, you board the train and you just gotta make sure that you arrive to the right train. Um, you can always ask the conductor and it's usually they're right near the train. Um, and then it will take you through and it will stop at various stations for, so I think you just gotta check the schedule to see. I think the latest train runs about coming back here is about five, uh, six or seven o'clock. 
So I think we might be able to make the train for the evening. If not, make sure that you contact your family members because if you Uber or Lyft back, it's gonna be at least $80, right? Um, I know because I've done that before. So possibly look at the train schedule. If I find something, I'll let you know. And I know it goes all the way to San Bernardino as well. So if you live toward that area, that might be a good option for you. But I know it stops in various parts in Riverside um, and Corona. So if you live near Norco, you can lift or Uber back from the train station, which only costs less about, about 20 bucks or less, right? Depending on how far you live from the train station or someone can come and pick you up like a friend or a family member. So I think a good option for us to look at is getting a train ride back. That's what I'm planning to do because I really hate driving in LAX and I hate asking people to do that. Unless I absolutely have to, then I'll 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 do that. Normally, I park at the the airport, and I will pay for like long term parking, and then I will come back because I hate asking people. But um, so, so just check the schedule, and then for our departure trip, if you weren't here, make sure that you are at RCC before eight a.m. because the bus leaves at eight fifteen, and if you miss the bus, you're gonna have to get to LAX before the flight. And you know, check-in for security at LAX is a little bit uh, longer than most airport, like Ontario or another airport. So, um, and if you bring electronics and, and things like that, you have to unpack those things. It all depends on their policy at the moment. Um, so, you know, try to size down travel light and I'm gonna keep the same thing in mind because <laughs> I'm gonna try not to bring so much stuff. But anyway, any questions? Okay, so don't forget to see me before you go home to pick up your insurance card if you haven't done that. Okay, so next week, we're only gonna meet on Monday and Tuesday, okay? I'm gonna give you Wednesday off so that way you can tidy up things at home and take care of your packing and get some rest, go to bed early. And then, you know, cause I know I like to do everything and everything before I go because I, I worry. Um, and I'm sure that you have tons of things to take care of, right? Um, if you're taking another class, make sure you let your professor know about your internet connection. Sometimes that might be an issue. Um, so that way they don't need you for late work or anything like that. Okay. So um, Monday and Tuesday next week only. Okay, we leave on Thursday, Wednesday, no class. I will post things on the door. Okay, and I will have, I will also send out a Canvas reminder just in case. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to finish up the lab. We're gonna try to go as far as possible. I know that I put a lot of things on there. I'm ambitious, wanna assign assignments. I will walk you through and we will learn some concept. Um, Next week, we're gonna do one short assignment and then we are going for two days and you're gonna take a quiz. So I'll have a quiz game ready um, by Monday morning. So that way, you know, and you will have time um, to do that if you wish to do that later, like on Wednesday or something. Okay. And there won't be any assignment during our trip except for gathering data. And I'll talk about the project on Monday and Tuesday. So let's go back to what we were talking about before. So where we left off when we started a few exercises in lab two, and you saw how we would be able to manipulate strings. Um, we work with numbers with built-in functions. And we started looking at how to use indices or index to be able to pull out characters from our group of characters as a string. And this is useful when you need to clean up data or if you want to create correction applications, um, things like that, okay? Now, in C-based language like Python, normally you would see that the, the programming language, the, the way it's built, it uses what's called a string object. So, Whenever you have a string, it actually create an object. Basically, it's just a location um, temporarily to be able to reference what kind of characters. So it treats it like a list of characters and it keeps it in the entirety. So that way you can have your entire string in one location. 
imagine that if we have a, 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 a like a word and if it's located elsewhere and it's not able to find all the characters, then we won't have accurate data. So with that, what you would see is you would be able to use some of the, the, um, the functions or the methods that are built with Python, okay? And take a look at the notes when you're reviewing for the quiz or taking the quiz. I do give you like 60 minutes for like 10 questions. So you should have ample amount of time and three attempts. So we will have like maybe two quizzes or so and a final exam and a project. So, and it should, it should be reflecting what we've learned in class. Now in a string, you can also use a built-in function to force things to become lowercase or uppercase, right? So when you use is lower, all that is is verifying if you have all lowercase string. But if you use lower only, that's going to force it to be all lowercase. So if I want to convert all my text to be lowercase, I would use lower function. And if I want to make my text uppercase, I would use upper function. Now, if you want to, um, sorry, I want to make sure that my caption is on. So that way it's easier to push through YouTube. Now, if you want to validate upper lowercase, then you would use is upper or is lower like this, okay? You can also merge things by using join. So there are tons of different type of functions that you can apply in Python. Um, we can also seek for a certain type of character using start with. So if your name starts with an L and you can use start with and look for the L. And so we're gonna do an exercise like that. All right, so with that, what I like to do is let's go to your lab two. And we're gonna do the next exercise. Sorry, let's change this. Okay, so we left off at number three we're gonna do number four next, right? I just talked about this. So we are gonna define a variable that's gonna be your full name in, like how you normally type, right? With the capital letter first and the lowercase letter following. So type it like how you normally type. And then what we're gonna do is we are gonna use these to be able to convert them to either all uppercase or all lowercase, right? Make it all caps or all lowercase. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up your Tawny. You can search for Tawny like this and open up the application. And if you want to use online interpreter, I recommend REPL, R-E-P-L dot I-T. So if you don't want to install, right, um, you can go to REPL IT dot com like this. And the cool thing about this is you see how I, I have an account with Google. I can I can use Google API login and it stores all my code online on the cloud so I don't have to download, I don't have to save anything to my computer. The beautiful thing about online compiler and interpreter is that we can use it anywhere as long as you have internet. And you can all, so to use online interpreter, you just click create and then you choose your, your choice of poison, right? <laughs> your language. So in our case, you would do Python. I'm gonna show you, and then you give it a name, right? So let's say I'm doing lab one EX4, CIS 30A like this. I normally put the course number so that way I know. So you click create. So just click create button and your shell is gonna be on the right. Your editor is gonna be on the left, right? And when you click run, you just click run like that and it shows everything on the right so now it does store some stuff temporarily but you don't need to be aware of that and then you just type your code here and then click run and it's output here so an, a good option to use is to use this in place of tawny or idle right but here i have my tawny so for our code oh i meant to click number four <laughs> sorry it's been a long day. 
Um, okay, so for our exercise four, we would start with our variable and you can call this full name or name or anything you like as long as it is distinguishable and it is not part of the keyword in Python. Keyword is like is in uh, specific things to already pre-made um, commands in Python. Then you are gonna type out your name. You can use single double quotation marks. So in my case, I have Casey Nguyen. And so when I wanna make this into lowercase, I wanna store it into a variable so I can just print from it. So I put lowercase or low name. And I want to bring down my, my variable name and you've seen how the dot operator used before. So we would do full name dot lower. And this is when we use the function. And then I wanna print it so I can see that is lowercase. Now, after that, we want to convert it to all uppercase. So I have another variable called up name. And I want to bring down my variable full name. And I use the dot operator to use the function upper. So what this does is it's going to execute, right, the conversion of this container, which stores your name. And then I want to print that out. You can nest the print without using the variable. Like I said before, be careful when you're using temporary memory because interpreter sometimes it loses the values when you have a very extensive program. So I normally create storage. And so if I need to reference it later, I can go to back to that variable or list or something like that to be able to pull data. And once you have everything typed up, you wanna print that out and you should see lowercase first and then uppercase second. So when you think about application like Word, right? Uh, Microsoft actually uses C Sharp and C Sharp is closer to the C++ than Python. So, when you hit the cap lock, right, basically it executes a command for the system. When you're on the application, what it is is executing a command that uses basically a function to make sure that you type things in cap lock. Or when you click the all caps button on Microsoft Word on the top in your ribbon menu, uh, you would see that it is pretty much the same. So we can still create different application doing this. And on the online form, know that user would type anything. And sometimes you have to clean up their comments, especially like if you read like people's review, right? Um, so a, a, a good way is for a developer to go in and clean up some of the things that people add into comments or if they want the exact review um, or you know do some kind of spell check things like that. So that's something that is incorporated with a function call um, for web development. Any question on exercise four? Lab two. So once we have it successfully ran, make sure that we copy or do the print screen. So press the print screen button. I'm gonna show you another technique, okay? Because leaving my class, you should know how to use your system a little bit more effectively. There's a feature in Windows called SNP. This is very similar to Mac OS, right? And SNP, what it allows you to do is cut a portion of your screen instead of taking the whole thing. What if I don't want to show everything on my screen? So when I'm using SNP, it's going to show up like this, and you're going to make a new SNP. And you're gonna drag what you want to cut like this. And then you would be able to paint. So it's gonna show up. So you can save this as a picture, a PNG file, right? When, you, when I save, it will be an image file or you can paste it into a Word document like this. See? So it comes in as an image 
on a Word document. Okay, so again, we use SNP, we call it using the search. Okay, and it's going to come up with the menu. You're going to make a new and then just drag it. Okay, so once you click new, it allows you to drag what you want to SNP and then you want to paste it or save it as an image. For my class, just paste it to the document like this. And so that's another way that you can actually take a screenshot or a part of a screenshot of something. <clears throat> All right, any questions? Okay, now we know how to use upper and lower. That's part of number four. Next, what we want to do is we want to play with, we want to play with join. So what join does is it's going to combine things together, right? Um, what happens, I don't know, I, I, I occasionally run across people who type their text with period to represent case, right? Like especially for some people who don't know technology very well. And sometimes um, I work with developer when, when, when I look at like applications and how secure it is and things like that. Sometimes, you know, I look at how they clean up um, user input. So what we can do is we can take things and we can join combine words together using a symbol, right? Um, so join allows you to combine strings, right? Or substring together so that way you can add instead of a space or a comma or a period, whatever symbol, you can replace it with another symbol, okay? So what we're gonna do is we are gonna create a program that's gonna have our family member names and you don't, you can have like three, you don't have to have too many or you can have more. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna join each of the name with the hashtag, okay? All right, because the reason why I want to use hashtag is you guys know you can tag things online, right? So whenever you click the tag, right, it, it, it just basically tell the application to add that symbol. Well, somebody has to write the code for that, right? So it's usually just say when the user click, if the user click this button, just add this hashtag symbol. And so when the application see the hashtag, it tags that whatever the string that you're trying to tag, like, you know, happy new year or whatever. All right, so here we are gonna do the next one. So click new document and we're gonna do exercise five. So I have a list called family members and you can say members or family, whatever you like. And I put in the names. Okay, and when I'm using a list, notice that it's using a square bracket. And each of the name, I want to put it in quotation marks because they are string, right, text. And I use a separator to separate each element in my list. So this is element zero, one, two, and three. There are four people, so zero to three is the index. And I want to print out the original list. I want to see what it looks like. And then I'm going to have a variable called sim. And remember that the variable is going to store another type of string, another string, which is your hashtag. You have to put it into a variable because you need to be able to use join with it. So when I join it, it's going to take the symbol and then attach it to every single name in my list. Okay, so it's going to say Benjamin, hashtag Joe, hashtag Paul, hashtag Kim. Okay, and in here, what I want to pass for the print is I'm going to use sim, which is the hashtag. And I would use the dot join. And again, you would see that you would see the dot operator being used here. And then for the parameter in the join, I would bring down my list name. So I'm saying that access this list, join each of the element with the hashtag symbol. That's what I'm doing with this line statement. So when I run this, 
I would see that the original list that I define is here, right? That's first. That's the first print. The second print, it joined it for me. So you can use any symbol or any character you want. As long as you use it correctly, it should be able to show you. And also refer to documentation if you're not sure how to use a certain function, right? Python documentation has mostly everything that you would need. Any question? So pretty easy. All right. Okay, so after we run, take a screenshot, print screen, or you can snip it and paste it to the lab two document so you can submit it by the end of today. So we accomplished two, two assignments by two days, three days. <laughs> Okay, so now what you're gonna do is you are going to use a pseudo function called start with. And in this, what is good about it is you can search for a certain character. You, you guys ever use control F? I do all the time. People send me like huge PDF. <laughs> and if I need to look at something for an important section, I hit control F and I type the search keyword, right? So you can search for the keyword using control F. Control F works with almost all, almost all applications, even on the web. When you're looking at the web page or an article and it's too long, right? And you want that one section and you don't want to keep scrolling down or hit next, next, next page, right? You can do control F and you can search for the keyword. So what this will do is start with, it's going to look for things that start with a certain character. It is a pseudo function because it has a search mechanism built in with it but it's looking for the first character, right? Remember the upper lower cases are different. So if, you, if you're searching for a lower case and it only has uppercase, it's gonna tell you false, not there, right? If it tells you true, like if I'm searching for capital J in John Jones, it's gonna say true because J, capital J is here and capital J is there, okay? So it looks at the substring. Okay, so we are gonna do your full name and we're gonna search for your first, first initial, okay? All right. So here is number six. So, so again, we can use a variable called my full name or full name or name. And we would define our name. So put it in quotation marks, single or double is fine. And then I want to print out, and again, we're using the dot operator just like the last one. So we wanna bring down the variable that stores our name and we wanna use start with, and you want for the parameter for start with, here you want to pass your character, which is your first initial. In my case, it's K, right? It could be J for you or N, L, okay? So let me clear this. And when you run it, it should just say true. So here is what you see what Boolean value looks like, right? It says that I am looking for my name that starts with the letter capital K and it found it, so it says true. But if I'm looking for lowercase k, I'll show you what happens. It says false. You see how upper, because the system sees the uppercase, a different value, a different number compared to a lowercase k. And that's how it can distinguish between upper and lowercase. Okay. Same thing with your password. Right, it tells you to use strong password, upper lowercase is different. If you type in all lowercase, it doesn't match, it tells you false. Okay, any question? Ah, oh, two lines, pretty easy. 
Right, screenshot, put it onto the document for your lab too. Oh, you see, like, you know, even though we have like 20 questions, you breeze through this, it's really easy. Okay, so this is also included examples in the notes. So if you want to practice, you can do the notes example. There's also optional book. You can take a look at that if you want to expand your coding skills. So after this class, if you finish successfully, I'll give you what's called, I, I use a, a, a digital batch system. I, I still have to release one for my fall semester classes. Um, I actually pay for it with my own money because <laughs> RCCD takes a long time to reimburse. So what that can do is you can link it to your LinkedIn and every skills that you earn. So there are a lot of employers on LinkedIn. My former students, they now run companies and own company. They always tag me on LinkedIn. Oh, I'm hiring so-and-so. Do you know anyone, right? Um, Digital Batch allows recruiter to see your skills, right? You see people who have certifications and training that they've done, right? So they use the digital batch. So when you complete this class, I will release a digital batch and it uses, uh, you know, very similar system to cryptocurrency. So it ties your name, your identity to a batch. And then you simply click on the, accept the option and then release it onto your LinkedIn account. So it works with most of social media. So I'll have it for intro to Python. Um, so that way, if you apply for a job later that requires it, you know, it might be useful. Okay. Now what we do is, any questions on six? No questions on six? All right, next, that's easy, right? <clears throat> so we are gonna do the next program, which is seven. We have three variables. It tells you to use username, user age, and user address. And we want to, Assign values to the variable. We want to check to see if they had type in. And this for students who know programming, we are doing input validation here, right? So we wanna check to see if they type in their name as alphabet. So when you use alpha, it checks for alphabet or characters only. Then we want to check for their phone number or their address is it, does it have digits, numerical value, right? Or is it all numerical values? So digits is really good with like phone number or age. So, you know, when you fill out the form and if, for me, I fat finger all the time. Um, so when I touch the screen, sometimes I accidentally touch something else. So if it's, if I type in something wrong, it will tell me, no, this is not correct. You have to type it this way, right? So that's called input validation and it's really important in the web. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna check these things, okay? For name, age, and address. An address has a mix. Let me open seven. So this is a little longer, okay? So I have the username and I want the user to enter their name. So you, you can, when we saw this before, and I wrote this as a pretty good input validation instead using a condition, okay? So as you can see here, when you're using an if statement, it's gonna check, right? For things that are true and false. So I'm saying if the username is alphabet, print, you entered this name. Otherwise, else, right? We would ask them to re-enter their name, okay? So this is how we can input validate, making sure that they type in their name in just with characters, no numbers. So when you're using the if statement, it's gonna check for things that are true only, okay? If the username is alphabet, if that is true, it's gonna show their name. Else, and you notice we're using a colon, so don't forget the colon after condition statement. 
the username and we would ask them to re-enter their name. Then I would have the another section for their age. I have a variable called user age and I ask them to enter their age. And again, we want to validate if it is just number. So we would say if user age is digit, if that is true, we would want to show their age. You, en you entered and then this number. Else, we ask them to re-enter their age. So if they mix letters and number, we would, they would have to do it again. And for Python, if you compare this to other programming language, C and C++ and Java, they do have built-in functions similar to this, right? But for those of you who took C++ before, that's a little bit more, right, complex because you have to say if it is this and this and this, right? Um, so Python's streamline a lot of these things through their built-in function, sorry. <laughs> okay. Then we have the address section. So user address, we ask them to enter the address. Now we want to use, is it alphabet and numerical? So alnum, if that is true, then we show the address. If it is false, else, we ask them to re-enter the address. So when you test this, you gotta give it, you know, your type in your name, your age, and then, you know, one, two, three, four, five Main Street or something like that to see if that works, okay? So you gotta give it arbitrary values or input information. So. And then at the end, we want to print out the summary. So a good practice is to type, to give them a page of everything that they have entered, okay? Normally they would have to confirm. So you would have to click the confirm button and that will go into a database, which is a system that stored the user record. So with this, what you learn is you also learn to apply conditional statement. And conditional statement is used in everything now, right? Especially in artificial intelligence, machine learning. There's a lot more going into machine learning and AI, but they also have a condition. Like if the user search for shoes, always give them this ad, right? And it uses your cookies to be able to find what you were looking at on the web. So it would just continue to advertise to you later on or send you, you know, advertisement email. Or it can say that if the user always search for this address on Google Map, right? Um, you know, add it to the common use list. Always prompt the user this when they open the map app. There's a lot of things that is useful with conditional statement. And you see input validation like this being used everywhere. Instacart, social media, right?
Now, when you get to your address portion, if you do like what I did, when you test it, you put in one, two, three, four, five Main Street, it's gonna go to the L section because it's looking for um, just numerical, right? Alpha numerical. So when we're putting in just the numbers in the front like this, so let me try this. One, two, three, four, five, Main, right? So when you type in the address, if you type the, the, the street name and the number together, it will pass. Otherwise, it's just gonna keep reprompting. Okay, so let me run it again so you can see. When I run, type in your name, right? So that's, that's true. So it shows my name and my age, my address. So if I do one, two, three, four, five main like this, it will pass. But if you do space main, right? One, two, three, four, five space main, it will go to the else because it, it looks at the string together like that, number and letters combined. So the alphanumeric has to be like this for it to go through and it says, thank you. I had a print thank you, but you don't have to do that part. You just do the summary is fine. So it shows right? My name that I type, my age, and then the address. Now is, for the is our num, that's the only way that we can use it is when it is combined like that, right? So what they have to do is they have to separate it into the field and use other function to be able to validate that. Any questions? If you enjoy this Python development, you can make a lot of money. Mostly, almost many, many companies use Python. I think the majority of the companies now use Python, so. Any questions? We're doing okay. So what you did here is you use Control, control statement or conditional statement for input validation. And we use built-in functions like is digit, is alpha, is alnum to validate user input. Input validation is really big in security. It's a way for us to control injection, right? People can type in a bunch of things, a script, to the field and they, that's how they can get your your username and passwords right from the database that's called SQL injection they can also inject in url many different things so any questions Right, screenshot, add it to lap two. And in your week one notes, you will find a section that talks about control statement. 
those are like the if and the loops. So we'll work on the loops in the in the next two exercises so you know. Are we okay? Do we need any more additional time? Okay, so on the next one, we're gonna do string slicing. And string slicing simply, we saw a little bit of this before, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull characters from our word, okay? And you can do it with indices, and you can also use built-in functions as well. All right, let's go here. So what I did was I recopy part, this part from the notes again. So there is a function called slice, and then this is a constructor. What that does is it's going to be able to go, right, to a, from a certain index, and it's going to slice it from a certain character to a certain character, okay? So we can tell it to slice how many character inside our word. So the parameter for this is the first part for Python in general, when you see the three parts parameter like this, usually it's start, stop, and step, right? We saw this in random before. Um, so where you wanna begin, where do you wanna end, and how do you want to go through, right? Like if I wanna go through every two characters, I would put a two, so it's gonna go every other, right? Um, or I can go every five characters and so on. So it's gonna do start, stop, and step. And this is an example. If you don't if you don't pass anything for the rest, it's gonna default to zero. Okay. So if you only put one, that's okay. You can put two or three. And we can also use negative indices. We saw this before. Okay. So we are gonna do number eight, and we're given this string, America, land of the free. And we want to slice and we want to only show America. We don't modify anything to the string. We're gonna pull that word from that long sentence and, and put it to itself, okay? And so we are gonna use index sequencing to slice and keep America, to show America. Then we're gonna do a reverse index. This one is gonna be negative values and we're only gonna show the free, which is the last word here, okay? And then we are going to look at the second, the fourth and every other subsequent character. We are gonna use the slice, right? And we're gonna use the parameter for slice. So four, eight. Here it is. So I have a variable and you can call it anything you like. And here I have it as ASTR, or you can say, you know, my string, whatever you like. And you want to define your string, how it's supposed to be or how it was given. And then I create another variable called S1 for my substring one. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slice seven characters. So from the left, you're gonna count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? America is seven character. So the first seven, I'm gonna take and, and put it into my variable so I can print it. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to slice using negative index. And when you're going from right to left, it's negative, right? So I'm gonna go from negative five to negative one. So here's negative one, which is the E from the free, okay? And if I count negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, it's gonna be right at the space, right? So I want to cut and 
from the right, that's going to be free. So I'm going to go from negative five to negative one. Because if you put negative one to negative five, it's the free backwards. It's going to be E E R F. So you have to do, you have to see how the system see, right? We're going to go from negative five, which is the F, to negative one, which is the E. So F R E E, not E E R F, right? And then I want to go through the entire string and I want to step every two. So I want to do every other character and pull that out and put it into S3. So once I have these variable, I would be able to print, okay? Now, what? why am I doing a list instead of a variable? Because I'm nesting. This is a list of character and this is a variable. This is a sub list of that list. So I'm doing a print, right, from my list and it's gonna be the variable. So a substring of the string printed. And this is called index sequencing for slicing. And we are also using slice function. And there you go. We have America free and every other character from the string, right? There's a lot of really cool things that you can do in programming. Sky's the limit. Once you learn a program, you're in. Any question? And keep in mind that this is one approach, okay? Every programmer think a little differently. So if you, sometime you would see the same other people with well, the way that they solve it is a little different. If you need help or have questions, let me know. Okay, screenshot added to lab two document. This is exercise eight. Push. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about membership operator. And what membership operator is, it's gonna look at the group of data and it's gonna identify whether the sub data or the substring in that group is, in, is part of that group, okay? So Python has a keyword called in, and it's also using is. So when you say, just think about like, if you're part of a club, right? Uh, you say that I'm in that club. So the membership operator, when you're using the keyword in, what that does is it's gonna go and check in that container to see if anything matches, right? So for example, I have fruits here. I have apple, oranges, and banana. And I want to see if banana is in this list. I just say banana in fruit, print, right? And it's gonna say that's true. But if I wanted to see if it's not in this group, so I can say grapes, not in fruits, 
that's also true because my original list does not contain grapes, okay? And this is very useful from retail to across. So using membership operator, knowing how, and it's really close to your English language, it's really easy to remember. So we can simply check to see if something's on the list or something is not, like doing in or not in, okay? And so for number nine, what we're gonna do is we are gonna ch check <coughs> and replace. So we're giving the string no pain, no gain. And we're going to replace, right? And remove all the punctuation. That means the exclamation point, the question mark, and the exclamation point in the given string. Okay. So we've seen replace before. In, in exercise three, uh, open a new document. This is nice. Okay. So here I'm using membership operator, as you can see, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a for loop. So we have a string and you can call it my string, S-T-R-N-G. I, I stay away from the regular string because that's a keyword, right? You don't want it to get mixed up. So you want it to modify on how you type string. And I want to define it and de declare it with the assign uh, or assign it with the string that's given. No pain, comma, no gain with all the symbols. And then I have punk is my variable and it's gonna hold all the punctuation. And you can go as long as you want, right? You can add in the other symbols too. This is useful understanding that, you know, when we clean things up with data, sometimes we want to take away all the extra things that people type, okay? Now what the for loop does is it's gonna, it, the way it reads is for CH for the character in string, if the character is in punctuation, right, we are going to replace it with blank. So when I'm using the, the, the quotation like this, I'm gonna take out all the symbol and replace it with a blank space, okay? So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna have it seek for, so the for loop, it's going to start with the first character. It's going to check, is this a, a, a punctuation symbol? No, right? Then go to the next. So it's going to check every character in the string. Okay, so it's going to go through and it's going to check. The reason why we have to use a for loop is anytime you have a list or a group of of something in the list, you have to loop through every single one. So for loops allows us to start from the beginning, right? And cycle through. It's gonna execute, it's gonna check everything in its body. So you have to indent, right? Your, your statement. So here we nest an if inside a for loop. So as it check the first character, right? So as it, it goes through and it loops through the first character, it's gonna also check it. Is this a punctuation? No, right? Then go to the next one. If it is a punctuation, then it's gonna add in the blank space and that's all it does. So basically this is an automated program. We can write this for the web page. Yes. This string, does that read like the string that what the character? The, the punctuation? Oh, oh, it's gonna that. Yeah, so P, the variable punk is all the symbol, right? You, you're not limited to the, just the exclamation point, the question mark, you can put in hashtag, whatever, dollar sign. So if we wanna clean up everything that's all the symbol that people type, that's what you do. So basically you look through every character that, that, that's seen in text, and check and see if those characters are symbols. Yeah. So if you can expand the punctuation list longer, 
Now, the reason why we use a four is, is four loops allows you to, to go through every character in the tree or every, every item on the list. I love for loop, that's my favorite loop because <laughs> I use it more often. So it's gonna start the beginning. And in Python, less stuff than C, okay, or C++, because C++ has three components, where you start, where you stop, how you increment. It's harder to remember for C, C++. Python is easy. You just use membership and you're good or range. So for range is very common too. Okay, so when you run this program, what it's gonna do is, see, the first round, it goes no pain, no gain. What happens, right? That's just, it's gonna go through and it's gonna take out the comma. You see the comma is gone, that's the first symbol is gone. So the next round, it's gonna take away the exclamation right? Then the next round, it's going to take away your question mark. And then the, the, the after that, right, it's going to take away the last one. So as it does that, it adds in the space. So the user doesn't really see the difference, right? But what the loop does is it's step by step. It's going to go through this one first. So one, two, three, four, four rounds to so take four symbol. So if you have more right? It's going to keep on going, right? So if I have more exclamation point or more question marks, it's going to keep going. Okay. So what? that's what the for loop does. And I had it print. So as it does that, it replaces, it's going to print. So if you take away this print, you're not going to see anything, but it still does it. This is just for human to verify that it did it. Any questions? So this is how we use membership with the nested condition. So you, as it loops, it's gonna check as well. Screenshot, add it to your assignment page. And we just finished. This is um, lab two, EX9. Okay, pretty good. You guys did well so far. Okay, if you don't understand something, ask. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the length. We've seen this a little bit before, but we're also gonna split, okay? We're gonna take two words that's identical and we're gonna cut it in half. So in this one, we're gonna split the string into two equal substring. This is perfect because it's identical. Sometimes you don't have identical, then you have to apply the condition, okay? So because this is exactly the same, we can do Python, Python. So for 10, this is how you divide it in things into half. And remember that this is, just my approach, right? A common approach, but you can you can apply other approach as well. Okay, so I have a string called string one, and it's the given string, which is Python, Python. This is number 10 for lab two. What I wanna do is I wanted to make the first string just this, right? Can you do index slicing? Sure, that's not a problem. But what I want to do is I want to actually operate it where it's, it cuts it in half because it's identical. So I would take the string and I'm gonna go from the P, which is the first item index zero to the N. 
and I'm gonna cut it, divide it into two, okay? As they are the same number of characters, it's gonna do a perfect slice right there. But I need to handle this part. You can do reverse index, but what we wanna do is we wanna use the same approach from the first. So for the second substring, the second Python, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna slice it, but we are going to apply what's called mod modulo. So this allows me to look for any remainder. If it is zero remainder, right? then it's gonna it's gonna slice otherwise right it's just gonna go to the end so this applies to a little bit mathematical operations where we look for the remainder if it's no remainder right otherwise it's gonna go through the length and it's gonna increment by one So when you when I print the first and the second substring, it should say Python Python. And yeah, we can we can use slides, we can use other things, but I want to show you how you can also use arithmetic operations to be able to do that. And notice how Python is, right? You can nest your condition statement inside another statement and it is more forgiving than other languages because other languages you're going to have to like put it into its own block its own section so you can write things in a in a more horizontal line versus vertical line This is usually a challenge exercise. When I give this to my online class, online only, sometimes they get stuck on this one. And usually I see them submitting it with using slides or indexing. That's fine. That's how you, that's how they learn. But, you know, normally I would add this part of my lecture. So to show that you can use mathematical operation, cut things in exact half, and if it is equally evenly divided, so when you divide things even, there's no remainder. That's why you check for the zero there. Because Python and Python, they are identical. You count up the number of characters, you divide it by two, there's no remainder. And we can check for the truth. Okay. And we run this, take a screenshot. You should have Python, Python. So now you have a substring and a substring. Okay. So for, for some students in here are in computer science, right? Um, I know that the UC now they do boot camp. So that means that the first two, three weeks, you have to code as much as you can, and they place you based on your qualification. So um, they give you problems like this and in different languages, sometimes Java, C, Python. And so I had a student, she was like close to 4.0 student, did really well in computer science. She, I think she went to, um, um, I don't think it's Berkeley. It's one of the UC up north. And she told me the first two weeks, they floored her. They, she came out, she, you know, she was intermediate. They ranked her. Uh, she, you know, leaving community college, she thought she was really good, right? So, and sometimes you, you know, I get rusty too. If I don't program in a certain language for a while, sometimes I forget, right? Just like all of us when we don't do something regularly. So I tell her, you know, the, the only way you get better is to do well. I think she should be finishing now and she got a job, but you know, like it's the UC and the CSU now, they do a lot of the boot camp for the students. They kind of rank the student based on, and that's how they put you in the class. 
right? So for some student that they finish the whole series of the CIS classes, sometimes they have to retake the class because they just didn't get all the objectives. Um, and I think that's good because it, it gets you ready for your job. When you interview, you have to code your way through. So my cousin is a, a senior developer for Java. He, you know, if you ever play Star Wars games or if you watch Star Wars movies, he did some CGI in that. And he did a lot of the Lego Star Wars games back in the day. So um, he worked for LucasArts for a long time. And now he works for a company that does a lot of marketing. Um, but he tells me when he, you know, got laid off and he had to re-interview, he interviewed for Spotify, right? And they um, they made him code for two hours. And he said if he was a newly graduate, he probably won't be able to pass some of those questions because they were really hard, right? So the industry is competitive. You're just going to have to, you know, just like any field, you just have to have to stand up to your plate. It's it's like you got to come with it. <laughs> if you don't, then you, you're just not going to have it because there's so many people going for the same thing. But once you have the job, it's great. Right. Um, and here, you know, that's why internship and all those things are really important. So whatever you go to, I encourage you to kind of get field experience. Like, you know, if you go into psychology, get internship. It's really good to network with people and find, you know, find ways into companies and so on. All right. Next. OK, so now we're going to focus a little bit more on control statement. and. Um, if you're looking at the notes later, okay, let me go to the navigation field. I categorize my stuff. So if you view navigation in Word, right, you will be able to see like um, if statement right here, you know, or you can do a search control F and then find. Okay. All right. So this is, it's on page 12. So we know that if checks for true only, so if it's true, it's gonna execute whatever's underneath it, the body of the if, which is the expression. And otherwise, if you have the if else, it's gonna go to the else section, right? We saw that, okay? And using the if, you often see that they would use, these are called logical operator, and it checks, it has, so if I say X and Y, X and Y has to be true with the if in order for it to execute. If one thing is false, it's not gonna go, right? It's gonna go to the else. Or if I say X or Y, if X is true and Y is false, it's still gonna execute. So the or is different than the and in the and both sides have to be true. For the or, one or the other has to be true for it to go. And then the not is the opposite, okay? So we use exclamation point in programming for most languages as not. And also in Python, you use not, N-O-T, okay? All right, so let's do John's H. This is perfect for liquor store, <laughs> right? Um, so John is 21 years old. We want to write a program to check to see if he's over 18, right? Or in California, you check for 21 to sell alcohol. Um, but in other places, they'll be 18. And so if, you know, we would use the if statement, this is a very short program. We're at 11. So I have age is 21. If age is greater than 18, print John is older than 18. And if you want to do 21, right, you say if age is greater than or equal to 21. So I would say if age greater equal 21, right, print you are older than 21. So when they scan the, the product, like tobacco, alcohol, it's things that require age limit, right? All they do is, you know, it's gonna prompt them, ask customer for date of birth, and then it, it compute the date of birth based on, you know, the current year, who, who's older than 18 or 21. So it's a little bit more complex than this, but 
maybe a few more lines. So in this case, it's going to look for the values. 21, is it greater than 18? Yes, right? So that's true. So it prints. It's going to print John's older than 18. Now, if I change his age, for example, if I put he's 11 like this, right? Nothing because we didn't have the else. You see that? So this program, it would be more complete if you use if else, right? But if he is 21, right? That is true. So it's going to execute the body or the expression of it. I get C++ student in my CIS 7 class after they take the CIS 5. Some, some of them are kind of weak in the conditional and loops area, right? Uh, this if is really easy. It would be true here to do here. Otherwise, it goes to the else and it will do the else. Like if it rains, bring umbrella. Okay, so that's true right now, we bring umbrella. I use this program for almost all my programming class, yes. Yeah. yeah, so uh, is this indentation error? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because we have a different way of doing it. We don't have any else, so this is not true, right? If it's, it would only print here if it's true, so it's being true with feedback. Yeah, sometimes the software earlier has to show you what it should be. It, it is a little slow. You know why? Because it has to go to the USB to the So yeah, um, yeah. So if if your condition is true here, it will execute here. If you do the L's L like you know, he's not older than twenty one, then it doesn't go that. It'll do that. <laughs> All right, questions. We're good. Okay, screenshot. All right, next one, a little harder. The sister A sells a, a 50 inch LCD TV for $400 and charges for shipping. Store B sells the same LCD TV for $530 and provides free shipping. You see this all the time, right? And so the user is like, which one do I buy? Free shipping or, or not free shipping and pay more? Okay, the television weighs 65 pounds. The shipping company charges $1.25 per pound to ship the TV, okay? We want to write a program to see which stores charges less for the TV, free shipping or not, right? And we want to implement if else statement, okay? So this is a comparison program, fairly easy. Uh, 
Okay, so I have store ATV, $400. So I define the variable because that's the data given to you. And the same TV is sell at store B, right? So TV weight is 65 pounds. We know that the shipping cost is going to be the weight times the $1.25. So we would say TV weight times $1.25. And we want to show the shipping costs. So I would print shipping costs and bring down shipping. Then for store A, store A, I have to buy the TV and pay for shipping. So I would take the cost of the TV, add it with the shipping. And I want to print out the total costs. Then store B TV, they charge $530. So we want to print out their price. And we're going to compare. If the total of A is greater than store B TV, print store A charges more for the TV. Right? Otherwise, else, we're going to print store B charges more for the TV. Pretty simple. So as you work through the program, you would see that your shipping cost is $81.25. Your store A TV with the shipping is $481.25. We're not including tax, right? The store B TV is $530. So store B charges more for the TV. And this is how retail gets you all the time. <laughs> so you kind of have to compute which one is less, even with the shipping. So in this, on how you would solve it is you put the data into your container, which is your variable. We compute the shipping. We add it to our TV for store A. Then we put TV for store B into a variable. With that, we would be able to write control statement or to compare. If A is larger than B, right, we would print which one is more. Else, if B is larger than A, right? Now, if the shipping cost is more, like close to the $500 or total for A, so it really varies based on how the shipping would be. Okay, so in this case, store A, we would pay less for RTD. So when it look at the if statement, right, 481, it's not less than 530. So it goes to the else. So B charges more for TV. Quite a few people today, huh? Maybe because of the rain. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Okay, so we run the program. 
So make sure that we indent for if, right? The error, sometimes it will tell you why it's not working. And then condition statement always have a colon. Loop two. Are we doing okay? Questions? Okay. All right, good. So after these two assignments, these are the majority of the concepts normally for the first three weeks of this course. Okay, so what I did was I combined the assignment so that way you get the objective. And when we travel, we don't have to do much of the assignments. Um, and then when we come back, we will focus on a few, a couple assignments and our project, and that's it. We're gonna do a GUI assignment and then your project. Okay, um, so we accomplished number 12. Now we're gonna do a grade calculator, okay? Yesterday, we did a little bit, and earlier this week, we did a little bit on this, but now you're gonna do a grade calculator. So it tells you that Marcella receives this grade. So you're gonna put this into a list, and then we're gonna give it a scale. If, if she has 90 to 100, that's an A, this is a B, C, D, and F, right? So what we wanna do is we want to do another type of control statement. And in Python, this is like nested if else. So it's if, else, if, else, okay? So let's open up. I'm going to pull this down a little bit so you can see. Okay, so I have for number 13, okay, I have a thing called grade, which is a list. And this is the grade that she's given 82, 91, 79, 63, and 97. And I want to find her average grade. We saw this before. So we're gonna do a total is gonna be sum of grades and your average is gonna be total divided by the five grades. So once we have the average, we display her average grade. And because there's so many criteria in the grade scale, we want to check if her average grade is less than and equal to 100, and in this case, we use the logical operator and average grade is greater and equal to 90. So when you have a range like that, 90 to 100, you're gonna use the and. And that is gonna make sure that it stays in that range. If this is true, it's gonna print A. Okay, if her average grade is less than this, it's gonna go here. It's gonna go to the next statement and check again. If her grade is less than 90 and greater than or and equal to 80, it's gonna print a B. So if this is not true, if her grade is below that, it's gonna go to the next one, okay? 
if grade is less than 80 and greater and equal to 70, that's a C. So if she gets below that, it's gonna go to the next one to check, right? So that will be 60 to 69. So if grade is less than 70 and greater and equal to 60, that's a D. And then below anything else below that, it's gonna be F. So the last else, you don't have to put any, any condition because anything below that is gonna be an F. And this is how we do a grade calculator in Python. So we see that her average grade is 82.4, which is a B. So in equivalence in other language, just like an else if, if else nested in an if else. So you can do it if else and then index if else, but in Python, it's easier for, for us to use it this way with the elif. So you don't have a bunch of indentation inside your block. You can use this later on if you want to find your average grade, right? Just type in your new grade in your list and then run it and you can tell whether it's a B, a C, a D, an A, a whatever. And we also learned how to use min-max before, so. So we learn how to use the and logical operator, right? And in Python, you type and like that. Different than other languages, it uses double ampersand, like C++. I used to teach C++ quite a bit when I first started here. I don't do it as that much because there are a lot of people here who, who knows how to do C++. Not so many people know how Python is. Now this would not work with an or because an or doesn't it has it doesn't check both sides right like the ninety and the hundred it only cares about one that's true and it's gonna go so my students sometimes they get confused between the and and the or. I'll have this video up by tomorrow. Okay. If you want to go back and look for something again, the last two already been posted. So I just post the yesterday, just now before class. Okay. And then there are also some individual exercises that I've done my own recording from before. So for my online class, I don't go over every single one like this. Some lesson I do, some lesson like when it's a little bit more hard, but I usually like give, I go over the harder example or exercise. So I do this for you guys just to help. And hopefully when you practice, you see how it works.
Okay. Any question? Screenshot. So through this, we achieve, we learn how to use if, elif, else. We also learn how to use logical operator. And we created a great calculator. I had a student that wrote 1,125 lines of code in assembly for my, one of my projects in CIS 11 <laughs> for a great calculator. And assembly is a low level language. It's, it's a little harder. Yeah, I had to read through a line, a big chunk of code for his final project. He did really well though. I think he's at like UCLA or one of the school now, but this is like a couple of years ago. Okay, um, I think some of you are still working on it. I'll wait a little bit. So we have a few more to go. Do you need a break? Yeah. Okay, all right, <laughs> I know. Like sitting, <laughs> typing, you know, these desks, do raise up some of them. I think they took some of the hydraulic things out, but I think only the front they might cut. Or yeah, I think we should still be able to raise it up a little bit. But yeah, get up. You can go to the restroom, get some snacks, and um, you know, relax a little bit. And then we'll see how far we go. Maybe I I might not make you do all twenty. <laughs> I know it's the end of the day. Some some of you probably had worked before this, so class probably tired. Let me pause.
Okay, let's start back up and then um, we'll finish a few more and then I'll let you go for the day. Okay. Okay, so we just finished number 13. Um, let me see. We'll do 14. We're probably going to skip 15. I have 15 if you're interested. It's e it's still also a four range. Actually, we'll do four, 14, 15. <laughs> All right, so let's finish fourteen, fifteen, and a couple more, and then we'll call it a day, okay? All right, so for 14, it says in the diet plan, the client loses 10 pounds the first month, 12 pounds the second month, and eight pounds the third month, and five pounds on the fourth month. We want to use a for loop to get the total weight. So this is what we call a running sum program, where each loop is, it's gonna add, right, the loss pounds together, okay? So this is gonna be, your exercise number 14. It's not too long. So the reason why I wanna do this is we wanna practice a little bit of the for loop. So we have a list called weight loss. We, we know that the client lost 10, 12, eight and five pounds. And we want to have a total variable that's gonna initialize at zero. This is gonna get updated as it, it loops, okay? So we are going to have it loop. So first it's gonna take go through and it's gonna have 10. The second round, it's gonna add 12. So as it do that, it's gonna put the total into this, this variable. And it's gonna go from one index to the next, to the next, and then the fourth. And it's gonna be able to print out the weight loss, okay? Then, now if you want to use the four range, so this is one approach, you can just do this part. But another way that you can do this is you can use a four range. So using range, you would say for, this is the index in range of the entire length of the list. We're gonna print out each of the index increment by one, okay? And then sum it. So there, is, there are two approach, the first approach, now for the second one, you still have to have the, the variable, okay? All right, so you don't have to write both of them if you don't want. So here, the first print I have is the total weight loss for the four months. This person lost 35 pounds. When I did the full range, it actually printed out each of the month right? So the loss for the month one. So how did it do that? I had it increment for the month to be able to show one, two, three, four, five. I mean, one, two, three, four. 
And as it does that, it prints out each of the month lost weight. 10, 12, 8, and 5. Then it gave me the total. So when you do it this way, it shows each of the loop or each of the index that it access in the list, okay, individually. And then we had it added up. So not the same. So the first one, it only prints this if you only did this for loop. So either way, you're still going to have it correct. Okay. You want more detail, then you can do it this way. So if you write from line two to line six, that's totally fine. You can also use line nine through 11 in place of line four to six. So when we're using range, we knew, we normally have to tell it from where to where. So we would say the entire list. So you would use the length. But if you use the membership operator, you just say that for the index in the list, which is weight loss, we're going to use, here's the compound operator. Okay. We're going to take itself and we're going to add it to the next index. Bless you. So when you use the plus equal, it's itself, it is equal to itself added, right? So it's gonna take 10, then it's gonna take 12, which is the next index added to the 10 and then eight added to the 22, and then five added to the 30. Now you can do this for like savings too, right? Like let's say if you save $100 the first month, $50 a second month and so on. So running some works for any time that you need to keep adding over a period of time, okay? So whenever that you have a list, we want to use a for loop. That's the easiest way. You can also use a while, but for is easy. Make sure we run the program, take a screenshot. Okay, so I'm going to have you skip 15 because you already saw how range works. We are going to do 16. This is a while loop. We have to know how to write that. Um, all right, so we're going to do 16 next. Okay. So for 16... We're going to do a restaurant application where, like a fast food restaurant application. We are going to add up the order for the customer. So 
Katie ordered a burger, a milkshake, fries, two tacos, nachos, and lemonade. Can we do this in four? Yeah, we can use a for loop to add up all the items like we did with the running sum. But in this one, we are going to use a while loop. So I want to show you how you can do this. So there are options in programming where we can write loops. So while is always going to execute that's true, very similar to if, right? But you don't want an infinite while loop unless you intend for it to be that way. So you have to let it exit at one point. Otherwise, it's just going to keep using your system resource. So what we will do, so we're not going to do 15. We're going to do 16 next, okay? Oh, wrong. Wrong lab, sorry. So I'm in lab one. Number 16. Okay, so for this one, similar to the other one, we're going to have to start with the list. So for number 16, I would have foods, or you can have order, whatever you like to call it. So it's $9.99 for the burger, right? $5.25 for the milkshake, $2.75 for the french fries, $2.99 for the tacos, $5.25 for the nachos, and then $3.75 for the beverage. Then similar to the one that you've seen before, we're going to have a subtotal. We initialize it as zero, but it's going to update this variable as it adds these items when it loops through. Now you want to use the J as the index value for each of the item. So J is going to start at zero, which is the first one here, 999. And we want to say while the index is less than the length of the list. So if I start at zero, right? One, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So zero is less than five, right? It's going to add up the total. I can use a compound operator here. I would be able to say subtotal plus equal food, you know, uh, with the index J, but you can write it this way. Subtotal is subtotal plus each of the item. So what it's gonna do is the first round is gonna take 999, plug it in here. Second round, it's gonna take 525, add it with the whatever the previous and, and update this variable. And it's gonna keep doing that until it gets here, which is, index five, right? We put that here, so it's gonna stop. It's gonna exit, okay? And as it goes through, it's gonna go through each of the subsequent elements. So I, for J is J plus one, that's gonna allow it, us to update each of the index. So go down the list, basically. And I want to round this to two decimal. You saw how to use format before. In this one, we're gonna round it to two decimals so it represents dollars and cents for us, okay? So subtotal before tax is $29.98 was bought on fast food. So when you go to McDonald's and use your kiosk, right? When you tap those items on screen, Basically, you're getting that subtotal. That's what's happening. When I was in high school, that was decades a year ago, Taco Bell was actually the first one that has automated kiosks. And that was so cool back then because I grew up in the era where there was no, no Google. <laughs> so, and my high school had Taco Bell on campus. So everybody went there. And so this is how you can use a while loop instead of a for loop, right? And this one, it exits when it gets to $3.75 because it's at the end of that list length, right? The value is gonna be 
equivalent. So it's no longer less than the length. So that's when it's going to exit the loop. Okay. Otherwise, you have an infinite loop. So if you want to use round, that's how you can use round with two decimal points instead of using the dot format with the two F for the float. And this structure is very close to what you've seen with C or C++ or Java too. This is how we would write it. Any questions? Run, screenshot, paste, save. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, elements. Let me take a look at my program real quick. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm only gonna explain this. I'm not gonna make you write this, but if you want to, you can, you can write it. Um, this is a little bit more complicated in the sense where it uses the break and continue statement, but I wanna explain it to you what that does, which is number 17. I'm not gonna require 17 or 15 on this one, right? Um, Cause I know some of you are like, oh, so much typing. <laughs> okay, so here, this one is a, this is, a program that what we're going to do is we're going to auto generate numbers from zero to 20. And we are going to find number 11 and we're going to stop. Right. So let's say that you can have an, a number generator, but you want to for it to stop at a certain number so we can use a break. OK, so what the break does is it's going to stop the loop. OK, it's going to stop executing the expression under the loop and it's going to pick up where the next part of the program is, which is line 10 and 11. OK. And then for the continue, it's a little different in that if it finds the number 20 when we generate 0 to 25, it's going to skip 20 and it's going to go to the next line. So both of these achieve the same thing in that it's going to pick up the next part of the program, but the break completely stopped the execution of the loop. Whereas the continue, right, it's going to skip whatever that it's checked in here in the body. Okay. So this is a way that you can force your program to stop at a certain point if it keeps going. Right. Normally, programmer, they use this to reinforce some kind of mechanism to stop, but not completely stop. It actually picks up in the next section of your code. In the past, people used to do like go to break and continue. Um, you don't see this very often unless you have things like, you know, options to choose where you want it to break out of the options once the user chooses. Okay. It's exactly what it's intended for as a, a, a word, right? Break and continue. So I'm going to run this so you can see, okay? So when you, so I have a list called numbers. It's going to store zero to 20 and then zero to, or uh, vowels for zero to 25. Okay. So I, I generated this list. For the first part, it's I wanted to show that it loops through. I have zero, one, two, three, and so on. But I wanted to find number 11 and it should stop there. See how it stops there? And then it prints out my list only zero to 11, even though I told it to generate zero to 20, okay? 
So you can make it a for loop with the range. And if you don't put zero in the front, it's gonna go zero to 20 automatically. And I have it append, so it's gonna plug it into this container. And when it finds number 11, it breaks out of the loop, it stops. For the second part, I use continue. So I have values as a list and I do the same thing as the first, but this is 225. If it fives, finds number 20, it's gonna skip. So you're gonna see. So the first round, it has zero and then it adds one, right? So I have second round two, three, four, and so on, all the way until, so it keeps looping until it gets to 19, guess what happens? It skips 20. So what it does is when it gets to 20, instead of going and loop through the 20, it goes to 21 loop. So it skips that round, okay? So that's how continue works is it picks up to the next one one instead of breaking and stopping right it goes to the next loop it completely stop it skipped 20. so i have from 19 and it skipped 20 it goes into 21 okay, and that's how break and continue works okay all right um okay so let's do the next one two more and then we go home Okay, so we are going to, um, this is our number that's given. We're gonna make a list, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, but we are going to change them to be 100, 300, 500, 700, 900, all odds. There's several ways that you can do this, of course, but we are going to use what we learned in this week. It says eight. Oh, sorry, wrong 18. 18. Okay. So you start with the list nums for number 18, and you want to print it. So I want to print the original list so I would see. So I have 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. I print out the list. And then what I want to do is I want to change these values. So when you redefining it with a different value, it's just gonna re, it's gonna store the new value to the list. It the only way that I can add new values is to append. You saw that how I did that with the break and continue example. So when you redefine it with a different list, it's gonna take that list and plug it in, right? So what I tell it is starting with the second element, 200, it's gonna replace it with 300. 300, it's gonna replace it with 500. 400, it's gonna re update it to 700. And 500, it's gonna be 900. This is the easiest way without having to go through a for loop, okay? So I basically use index and I update each of the values starting from the second value in that list. Done. Yes, you can use a for loop or a while loop to do this, but that takes a long time. Or you can do it individually with a function. There's so many ways to solve this. So for those students who are in the computer science area, the most efficient, effective, best performance way is going to be the selected way, okay. Use less memory space or need less execution power. That's, so when your solution comes in with a hundred other people who apply for that job, they're gonna measure it based on efficiency and how you, know, how you solve that problem effectively, okay? So there's no one answer. A lot of the times we want to see the best answer is gonna be the most efficient answer. So there we go, my new list, I have all odd numbers. So when you redefine your list, right? You just tell it to update the indices. And that what that does is it has a for loop in the back already. When it, it goes through, it loops through one through 
index one through five. So that's going to be the second through the sixth value or the fifth value. Why did I stop at five here is it has to go past the last one. Okay, not at the last one, because if you put four, it's going to stop right here. Okay, easy. Like four lines. Okay, we, uh, let me see. If we, let's do this one and another one and then we'll go home. Eight, 19 and 20 and that's it. Okay, so for number 19, we have a list of animals, right? And what it tells us, so before you guys type, let's look at the requirement. Um. We want to add rabbit to the list. We have the list of dog, cats, and birds. We want to add rabbit to the list. We want to add hamster, turtle, and fish to the list. And we want to um, use the operator to include birds and snakes. And then we want to update the list three times. Okay, really easy. Okay, so you start with the list, dogs, cats, and birds and you print the list. So let's say we own a pet store and this is what we, we, we sell or we allow people to adopt. Anytime that you need to add anything to a list, remember you need to append, okay? We need to append rabbits to this list. So it's gonna add dogs, cats, birds, and then now rabbits. You can also extend but you only use extend when you add multiple things to the list. So if I need to extend the list to have three more, I would do hamster, turtles, and fish. You use extend. Okay. Another way that you can add two more things or multiple things is you would do a plus sign. And then I want to update it three times or show it three times. I multiply it by three. That's it. The reason why I have you do this is so that you understand how to add an element to the list. You can also do a push, okay, where it adds it to the last one. But when you append, it's going to take rabbits and add it after birds. It's going to be the last elements added here. When you extend, it's going to take this list, this sub list and add it inside. So it's going to nest another list. So it's going to treat this as one entirety thing and put it into a, a container. And same with this, okay? So when we run this, you're going to see we have the original list, we added rabbits, okay? Oh, I lied on that. <laughs> when you extend, it just add those three hamster, turtles, and fish to that. You then add, um, you add it with the operator. So you can also use a list to add with the operator. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at the output, when you do the adding for number 16 here, oh, birds and snakes, right? Yeah, it just it just added it following the fishes. And then when I undo it three times, so it makes the list times three, so it's, it's triple that and put it in a big list. Okay. Why is this important? It doesn't necessarily have to be birds, cats, and dogs. It could be numbers, right? Data. 
you might need this for your project or something. Easy? Any questions? So list is pretty cool. List is changeable compared to tuple, where we will talk about it next week. A list, you can expand it or shrink it. So if I need to get rid of one of these things, right, I can pop it. So it, when I pop, it's going to take the last item and it's going to pop. We'll talk about it more when we work on tuple. Tuple is more static. This is dynamic. So for those of you who are familiar with C++, this is like dynamic array, but it's not a form of array, it's a list. There is array in Python too, so. All right, last one. So run screenshot. One more, and then I'll stick around to help if you have questions. Okay. So for 20, we are going to take two lists. This is a two dimension list. Okay. And the way that you read this is it's like a table. This is the first list. This is the second list. So think of it like columns and rows. Okay. So Jack is 22. Lisa is 27 and so on. And that's how we intended for it, to, for it to be. So this is a 2D. In Python, anything more than two dimension, we use a dictionary. I love that about Python in that, so when we do read list comprehension, we would normally use dictionary comprehension when it's 3D and more, right? Other languages, you have to nest it so many ways in the arrays. So what we're going to do is we're going to access this list and this list using a for loop. And so that way we can display each of the user and their appropriate age. Okay. So here we go. Last one. This shows you how you can use 2D lists or comprehend a 2D list. That's what it's called. Okay. So I have a list, so make sure that we recopy what we give. We were given. I have students, Jack, Lisa, Tomas, and Daniel. So these are their ages. I'm missing one. Sorry, guys. One second, let me double check. 2730. Oh, that's right. I have it right. So when you do, when you have a two dimension list, you are going to do a nested for loop. That means that it's gonna loop on the outside, which is the first list. It's gonna access each of the element like Jack, Lisa, Tomas, and Daniel while it's doing a loop on the inside. So it's gonna do Jack 22, Lisa 27, and so on. That's what we intended for, the, for it to do. So we would say for i, this is the index of the element in range of the entire list. And then for j, which is the index of this list, in range of students, okay, we are going to print both i and j. And then print. So to show that Lisa is 27, you would do a print I1 for I in students. So this is an option. 
Okay, so you can stop like right here. That's fine. I want to show you how this is different for each. This is optional. Okay, but if you just want to print Lisa, it's going to access the second element, right? On so this is the list number, which is list one, list zero, the first list and the second element. So first list, second element. That's how you use index. If I want to access 27, second list, second element. Okay. It is confusing, but we start with zero for that. Okay. So when I print, it shows Jack, Lisa, Tomas, and Daniel, and the H's to print Lisa, 27. I do four, print I, one, four I in students. So to do two dimension list comprehension, we should use we should use um, nested for loop. Okay. So when you have a two dimension list, list number, index number, that's how it works. Like Lisa 27, list zero, index one. If I want to see Tomas 30, I would say list zero, Right, 30, index two. Daniel, list zero, index three. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, one, zero, one, three and, three and three. As you are Lisa, print one and one. So 30 is gonna be zero, one, two, two. List one, two. So to do index, index, just getting used to how it reads starting at zero. Okay. So if I do Lisa, I need to access the index and it's going to loop through the list. Okay. Same. Print screen. You did a lot today. This is sometimes loops is a little harder, and also list is also nest list is difficult. I'll come back to the two dimension list later on. Um, so we'll talk about it more. Okay, so save and you can submit it on Canvas. I'll try to update your grade this weekend or by next week. Okay, while you're doing that, anybody have any questions? We'll do attendance next. Oh, sorry, was someone still working on their, uh, their program? Let's take care of attendance. Hmm. Let me end recording real quick.